on. I'm Amit Parak and I would be taking you through the November 2016 CA final SFM question paper. So let's start. There we have the first question. The, the spot rates have been given to us. Uh, INRs 66.25 something per US dollar. So this is the buy rate and this is the sell rate. And they've given us the two month swap points, the three month swap points. So these are essentially the premium points. How do I know that these are the premium points? Look at this 70, 90. So when you have low and high, low and high, that would indicate the premium points. In a spot transaction, delivery is made after two days. Given that we are talking about April 3rd, the spot date would be taken as April 5, 2016. Now assume one swap point is equal to 0 0.0001. Even if this were not to be given, I think uh, uh, we should have been able to uh, uh, understand the swap points, interpret them, and use them to calculate the forward rates. How we do that, I'll, I'll, I'll just show that. Now, what are we supposed to answer? You are required to ascertain swap points for two months and 15 days for June 20th, 2016. Determine the foreign exchange rate for June 20, 2016, and compute the annual rate of premium discount of US dollar on INR or on, on an average rate. So how do we go about? Let's see. So let me show you. Now currently this is what the spot rates are, the bid rate and the ask rate. So the spot rate currently in terms of uh, rupee USD is 66.2525 and 67.45945 so 5945 so this is 9 okay so uh, we need to find out the swap points for two months 15 days now look at this this is two months swap points and this is three months swap points so two months 15 days is your 2.5 two and a half month swap points. Now that's going to be the average of these two. So 70 plus 160 divided by two, which is 160 plus 70 is 230. 230 divided by two is 115. And 90 plus 186, which I believe is uh, 190, 276 divided by two. That gives us 138. So I've essentially taken the average of this and this. That gives me 115. The average of 90 and 186, it gives me 138. So that's a 2.5 months swap points. Now, how do I get the, so that, that kind of answers the first question, the first part of the question. The second is I need to find out the forward rate. Now, the forward rate is going to be, look at this, 115, 138. Now, when you have low high as the premium points, the swap points, that indicates that the forward is trading at a premium. That means US dollar on a forward basis is trading at a premium. So I'm going to add this 115 to 66.25. Uh, so the way we do it is, uh, so let me just show it to you. Uh, the So when they say determine the foreign exchange rate for June 20, 2016, I think what they mean is determine the forward exchange rate, okay? We would not really know what is going to be the actual rate, but we can find out the forward rate. So the forward rate is going to be 66.2525 plus 115. So that's how you add it up. So that would give you 640. So I think this is what you get. Similarly, you can add uh, 138 to 67.9945 to get the uh, to get the ask rate. So let me just show you the calculation very quickly. So when you add 267.5945, you add to it 138. All right, so you're gonna get 67.6083. Okay, so there we there you have the forward rates, two and a half months forward rate, bid as well as ask. Next question: Compute the annual rate of premium or discount of US dollar on INR on an average rate. Now they haven't really made it clear 
uh, in terms of what is the premium or discount for which forward are we looking to calculate the premium or discount now I would like to believe that they are still staying on the two and a half month forward if that be so then we know that the average spot rate okay is going to be this plus this divided by two the bid plus the bid rate plus the ask rate divided by two I've already calculated it and you might just want to check the maths of it but I think it will turn out to be 66.9235 how did I get this this rate plus this rate divided by 2 I also found out the average 2.5 month forward rate so that is this plus this divided by 2 and that gives me 66.9362 okay so this is the premium at which the forward trades and we are talking about a 2.5 month uh, forward now I need to calculate the annual rate of premium guys remember for me to find out the premium or discount I take the forward rate deduct spot rate from it and divide it by by the spot rate so that would mean uh, this is my forward rate this is my spot rate so 66.9362 minus 66.9235 divided by 66.9235 okay so uh, you, you and and not to forget and not to forget that this gives you the premium um, uh, for two and a half months for me to annualize it uh, this will get multiplied with uh, 12 divided by 2.5 okay we are analyzing it and once you do that so you you calculate this multiply it with 12 divided by 2.5 you're going to get 0.091 percent so that's the premium at which the forward is trading and this is the annual premium all right so this question was pretty easy i think uh, most of the candidates should have been able to crack this so let's now move on and look at the next one the following information is available in respect of security A, uh, the equilibrium return, so that's a return of A. Uh, the market return is 12%, the 6% treasury bond is trading at 120. The covariance of market return and security return has been given to us and the coefficient of correlation between market return and security return again has been given to us. We are required to determine the standard deviation of market return. So I'm going to take the market return as a M and the security return as I. So the two things that we are supposed to calculate is one is this and the other is this. The standard deviation of the market return, the standard deviation of the security return. Now look at the equilibrium return. Now we know that the equilibrium return of the security can be find, found out by applying the CAPM model which says that the security return is the risk-free return plus beta into market return minus the risk-free return. So we take the market risk premium. Now let's look at the, the risk-free return. That's something that we're going to get it from the treasury bond. Now you have a 6% treasury bond trading at 120. They haven't really specified the maturity of the treasury bond. It gives a coupon of 6 uh, if it has a face value of 100, which I think it has. Uh, the, the the coupon that it gives is 6 and since it's trading at 120 we can take the yield as 6 by 120 which is 5 percent so uh, effectively I've, I've assumed it to be a perpetuity treasury bond uh, it might not be so but I think this is fairly a tenable assumption to make that it's giving a coupon of 6 and has a price of 120 so approximately the yield would turn out to be 6 by 120 into 100 which is 5 percent so that's going to be taken as a risk-free return now uh, what's the equilibrium return of the stock it's 12 percent so 12 percent is equal to 5 percent plus the beta of the stock into market return minus the risk-free return so there we have now if you solve it and you get the value of beta it will turn out to be 1 so we know that the beta of stock is 1 again you know that the beta of the stock is arrived at by dividing the covariance of the stock return with the market return uh, by the variance of the market return okay now we know the covariance of the market return and stock return it's given as 196 percent I think uh, 
they might have most likely made an error this should have been 196% square because generally variance and covariance are quoted in terms of 190 uh, in, in terms of percent square so I'll take it as 196% square and uh, divided by the variance of the market return beta is 1 so this divided by this is equal to 1 so that tells me that the variance of market return <coughs> is 196% square that means the standard deviation of market return is the square root of this which is 14% okay in case if we would have taken it as percent then you would just have to live with it so in that case uh, the standard deviation of market return will be the square root of 196% which is 1.96 so um, and and in that case uh, you will have to calculate uh, the, uh, the the square root of uh, of of 1.96 which again is fairly easy for us to calculate so that should not be a problem so depending on what you have taken it as percent or percent square this is how you would go about calculating it uh, move on look at the next one uh, uh, th we need to find out the standard deviation of security return now we know we already know the standard deviation of market return we know the covariance of the stock return with the market return now look at this we have been given the correlation between the stock return and the market return and uh, let me just use this space to work it out correlation between stock return and market return is covariance of i m divided by standard deviation of i standard deviation of m okay so which means that 0 0.80 is equal to let me just use a different color so that you are able to figure it out okay 0 0.80 is equal to the covariance which is 196 percent square divided by the standard deviation of the stock return which if we don't know the standard deviation of market return is 14 percent so into 14 percent okay so uh, there we have it uh, so we can calculate the standard deviation of I it's going to be uh, 14 if I get it right 196 percent square divided by 14 percent into 0 0.80 uh, in case if you work it out it will be 14 percent divided by 0 0.80 which I believe gives you 17.5 percent so there we have uh, the standard deviation of the stock return for the standard deviation of market return that's going to be 14 percent all right so let's now look at part C Mr. A has invested in three mutual fund schemes as per the details given below now uh, so we have three mutual fund schemes they have different date of investment the amount of investment NAV the net asset value per unit on a per unit basis at the entry date so the day when uh, Mr. A invested into these schemes and dividend received up to 31st 3 2016 and then the NAV uh, as on 31st 3 2016 assume one year to be 365 days so we've been given three schemes and um, we've been given the detail of the NAV at the initial date the NAV on the final date and the dividend which was received during the holding period show the amount of rupees up to two decimal places so, all right so you are required to find out the effective yield up to three decimal points all right on per annum basis in respect of each of the above three mutual fund schemes up to 31st three 2016 now the good part is uh, uh, that uh, you will have to do similar working for all the three uh, so in case if you were to able out, uh, able to work out one uh, clearly the other two would follow suit so what I'll do is I'll basically work it for uh, mutual fund A but trust me it's the same working that's going to be extended to B and C so uh, let me take it so what was our initial investment our initial investment was uh, 1 lakh so all these amount are in rupees and uh, the holding period was 4 months so our holding period is it four months or five months so 11 12 1 2 3 so it's basically five months okay so five months so 
you'll have to be mindful of the number of days that it would have so you'll have November December Jan Feb March so we'll have to count the number of days uh, the final value is uh, something that we'll have to calculate now so you invested 1 lakh to begin with what is it that you took home by 31st March 2016 uh, because think of it guys we need to calculate the return so I need to know the initial value the my initial investment and my final take home uh, the 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 NAV finally was 10.25 so what I would have taken home would have been uh, 10.25 into the number of units now what's the total number of units that I would have bought well it should have been 1 lakh divided by 10.3 Right, so this is what you would take home. Not to forget that you also received a dividend of 2850, which again is an income for you. So we're going to calculate this. Now, this would turn out to be 1 lakh 2364.56. Okay, so we need to calculate the yield over the holding period, which we term as the holding period return. My holding period return will be one lakh two three six four point five six minus one lakh divided by one lakh into hundred. So that gives me two point three six percent. All right. So what shall be my annual yield? So your annual yield could be calculated based on simple interest or compound interest. So let's say if I take it based on simple interest, it's going to be 2.36%. Now this is the return that you would have uh, earned over five months. So if you just add up the number of days over October, November, December, Jan, Feb, I believe it would be around 152 days. So you can just count it month-wise, uh, November, December, Jan, Feb, March. So it's going to be 31 plus 30 plus uh, plus 31 plus 31 plus 29 so that kind of gives you 152 days so over 152 days you earn a return of 2.36 percent so for a 365 day period which is a year your return is going to be this so this is what I have analyzed on a simple interest basis we could have also done it on a compound interest basis so this gives me around 5.7 percent or 5.67 percent to be precise Alternatively, I could have taken 1.0236 raised to the power 365 by 152 minus 1. So this would have been the power. Okay, so I raise it to that minus 1 into 100 and that again could have given me an answer very near to this. But this would have been the effective yield over the year. Okay, so that answers this question. Uh, so let's now move on and look at the next one. A limited has issued convertible bonds. We all understand convertible bonds. These are bonds which can get converted into equity, which carries a coupon rate of 14%. Each bond is convertible into 20 equity shares of the company A limited. The prevailing interest rate for similar credit rating bond is 8%. So which would mean that uh, we could take the yield of this bond as well as 8%. We could take it as 8% because similar bonds with similar credit rating seem to be trading at 8% uh, and and we are assuming that those bonds as well uh, could have the same features as as this bond has the convertible bond has five years maturity it is redeemable at par at rupees 100 so it gives you a coupon of 14% now what are we supposed to calculate so we know the so l let's just sum up the features of this bond it's a convertible bond has a life of five years has a coupon of 14% and uh, is trading most likely trading at an yield of eight percent and has a face value of 100 and being convertible uh, it's been indicated that it could be converted into 20 equity shares we've been given the discount factor at 14 percent and at eight percent for the valuation of bond these are the set of discount factors which would be relevant to us what are we supposed to calculate well the current market price okay assuming it being equal to its fundamental value that means we don't really take into account the value on account of convertibility uh, minimum market price of equity share at which the bondholder should exercise the conversion option so uh, the, 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 the price of the equity share at which uh, 
this uh, the conversion might just look attractive enough and duration of the bond so uh, we will use the Excel to calculate the value as well as to calculate the duration of the bond uh, and uh, it will be much easier working on the Excel so let's get started so let's have uh, uh, the data over here so we have the year we're going to plot the cash flow and we'll have the discount factor and then we'll try to find out the present value of cash flows so in year one two three four five because it's a five-year maturity bond the cash flows would be 14 percent coupon so 14 rupees every year uh, in the final year it's going to be 114 the discount factors uh, have been given for f so we're going to take it at 8% because this bond will be trading at 8% yield so the discount factor which have been given in the question itself so those are the ones that I'm using 0 0.926 uh, 0 0.857 0 0.794 0 0.735 so this part of calculation is something that we can or we are able to uh, forego because that was already given in the question so we've taken the discount factor now I need to find out the present value so the present value is going to be uh, the cash flow into the discount factor so that's what we're going to take so I'm going to find out the present value of all the cash flows and then get the price of the bond the price of the bond is going to be the summation of all these cash flows so we add it up to get the price of the bond so there we have uh, the price of the bond it is 124.002 so that gives me the current market price so the next question that was asked was uh, the minimum market price of equity share at which the bondholder would exercise conversion option think of it guys this bond is uh, can be converted into 20 shares now when are you going to convert it into 20 shares well normally investors will will try to delay the conversion uh, so it it does not make sense uh, to convert it all in case if the share price is below six rupees twenty paise. And how did I get? I, how did I get this? I divided one twenty-four by twenty equity shares, because at any price below this, uh, you will get less value out of the bond by converting it into shares. So you would rather prefer retaining it as a bond and retain the value of 124.002 at a price over and above this at this price or above this you might still consider converting it into shares having said that normally an, an investor in a convertible bond will delay the conversion because having that option to convert in itself is valuable so you rather prefer retaining that option okay so this gives the answer to the second question the minimum price of equity share at which bondholder uh, should exercise conversion option rather they should have worded it as uh, at which the bondholder might explore exercising the conversion option the third part is duration of the bond now let's calculate the duration of the bond now uh, you should be familiar with how to calculate the Macaulay duration the Macaulay duration is the weighted average life of the bond and where the weights are going to be the present value of cash flows and of course uh, the variable that we are talking about is the life of each of these cash flows so we're going to take uh, PV into time okay so that's going to be our uh, next calculation and then we'll divide it by the sum of the PVs to get the average life of the bond which is known as Macaulay duration so let me just do away with this so let me first calculate this portion so my present value into time this is my present value and this is my time factor so there we have it and I'm going to calculate it for all the other cash flows and 
then add it up all right so for people who've done Macaulay duration will be able to comprehend what I'm doing Macaulay duration is equal to this summation divided by the price of the bond so the average life of this bond is around 4.029 or let's say 4.03 years now that's Macaulay duration so they've asked the duration of the bond so it could be they they might be implying Macaulay duration just to be on the safe side I'll also calculate the modified duration modified duration is Macaulay duration divided by 1 plus yield so it's going to be Macaulay duration divided by 1 plus yield now what is the yield at which this bond is trading 8% so 1.08 that is the yield at which I divide okay so this gives me the Macaulay uh, the modified duration so Macaulay duration is nothing but the weighted average life of the bond of the bonds cash flows where the weights are the present value of the cash flows uh, and of course the variable is uh, the timing of those cash flows the life of each of these cash flows and uh, modified duration is Macaulay duration divided by 1 plus yield so this should be pretty simple so let's now move on to the next question let's go through the next one now this is on Forex LMN limited is an export oriented business house based in Mumbai the company invoices its customers currency the receipt of US dollars 6 uh, lakh is due on 1st September 2016 and we are talking about 1st June 2016 so June July August so after three months they are supposed to receive 6 lakh dollars LMN limited uh, the exchange rate spot rate one month forward three month forward has been given to us uh, uh, US dollar per rupee so instead of giving in terms of rupee per dollar rupees per dollar they've given us in terms of US dollars per rupee the exchange rate uh, the rates which are trading uh, or, the, or, the, or the rate at which the futures are trading has also been given to us for the June series and the September series and the contract size has been given to us uh, the initial margin now this would be applicable for the future contracts because that's where margin gets uh, deposited and the interest rates in India for a month and for three months as well has been given to us on 1st September 2016 the spot rate was uh, in terms of US dollar per rupee given and the currency future rate as well is given so uh, very likely the future September future does not expire on 1st September but it kind of trades at these levels so in case if we were to go uh, take the futures contract and take a position there we, we, we sell dollar futures to hedge our exposure uh, so LMN sells futures to hedge its exposure of receivables uh, then it will have to unwind its future contract on 1st September it may be assumed that variation margin would be settled on the maturity of the futures contract so uh, this question is something which has already been discussed in the practice manual this and the subsequent question so I might uh, as well skip this maybe I'm going to take up this and um, and but I think uh, going forward if there are questions uh, which are which are already there in the practice manual and uh, which are more or less the replica of those questions uh, then I might just highlight the kind of solutions that have been given and it might do good if you could just go and uh, look at those uh, solutions uh, for now we need to calculate we need to figure out the methods which would be most advantageous for LMN whether the forward contracts currency futures or not hedging at all which of the three would be most advantageous clearly the most advantageous method would be in hindsight I should qualify would be one which results in the maximum rupee cash flows right because here is an exporter who is going to receive six lakh dollars three months down the line he would want to hedge simply because he want to hedge himself against the volatility in the US dollar INR exchange rate now sometimes in hindsight we realize that maybe not hedging at all could have been much better because who knows dollar might have appreciated over time and clearly uh, selling it in the open market when you receive the dollars could result in better cash flows 
but that is something that you would know only uh, in, in, in hindsight I mean that's something that you would not know to begin with but I think what the question implies is that you just need to figure out where your resulting cash, cash flows are better at the end on 1st September and so that method could have turned out to be the most advantageous so let's very quickly look at this uh, though I should say you have a question uh, which is very very similar to this so for people who would have gone through the questions and practice manual I believe Forex should have been a cakewalk so we have a three month period so let's first look at the forward route now since this guy is an exporter he would look to sell uh, US dollars so he would sell USD 6 lakh on a forward basis okay at uh, what rate so the forward three month forward is 0 0.01458 so 0 0.01458 dollar per rupee so that's the rate at which he would sell his six lakh dollars on a forward basis okay so what shall be the rupee realization the rupee realization is going to be now you want to get rupees right so here you have dollars how would you convert it into rupees so you would say when I divide dollar by dollar per rupee rupee goes up and hence I would be able to get rupees so that, that's that's a nice way of figuring out whether I should multiply this with this or divide it by uh, divide this by this you know the answer lies in the math of it so you have USD if you divide USD with a USD by rupee rate this will reciprocate right so this will result in USD into rupee by USD so this this cancels and you get the rupee cash flows so 6 lakh divided by 0 0.01458 that is the resulting amount of rupees that we one would get uh, once we work this out it would be 4115226 3 so seems like 4 crore 11 lakh 52,263 now let's look at futures now first we need to figure out how many contracts is this person going to uh, sell alright in case if these contracts are of dollars so we just need to figure out how many contracts would he engage in one contract size is 30 lakh rupees okay so 30 lakh rupees is one contract size so the number of contracts would be first we need to look at what is the futures rate the futures rate is 0 0.01449 so this is the amount of rupees that he would expectedly get in case if he were to uh, uh, in case if he were to let's say buy rupees uh, on a future basis or let's say sell dollar on a future basis these are the total number of uh, units that he would have to or the total number of rupees that he would get since every contract is worth 3 lakh or 30 lakh rupees so this would give me the total number of contracts this is around 13.8 so that means nearly 14 contracts is what he would he would undertake uh, because you can't really take uh, partial contracts so the margin that he would have to give would be 16,000 for each contract so that would be 16,000 into 14 contracts which is uh, 2,24,000 now this cash flow is something that would be recoverable but then you do incur interest cost on it so that's something that we have to be mindful of what shall be the realization well the realization is going to be 6 lakh dollar divided by 0 0.01 uh, okay so I, I, I think we need to go back so my on, on the final day uh, on September 1st the future would not have expired okay now at that point of time what would happen this uh, company is going to sell its dollars in the open market and 
unwind its future position so it would make some profit or loss on future now the amount that it would get from the spot market is going to be six lakh dollars which it would sell in the spot market at this particular rate so we can easily calculate this is the rupee amount because this is the spot rate so this would give uh, 4 crore 10 lakh 67,000 six, uh, 762 okay now we also need to calculate the profit or loss that would be incurred on futures now guys remember uh, this chap so we need to look at uh, the profit or loss that he would have made on his futures contract so that as well needs to be taken into account look at this this chap is an exporter so given that the exchange rates are being quoted in US dollar per rupee so if rupee is taken as the base currency this chap was interested in buying rupee and he contracted to buy rupee at 0.01449 dollar per rupee so that's the rate at which he would have been buying the rupees now on the on 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 the day at which he had to unwind his future the future was trading at uh, us dollar 0.01462 per rupee that means uh, rupee had appreciated over time and hence the future prices of rupee had gone up which is good news for this guy because he was any which ways uh, long rupee he had gone long rupee futures so this is the kind of money that he would make on every rupee that he would have sold on a future basis since uh, he had uh, sold three 30 lakh rupees for every contract and that 214 contract so that will help us uh, get a sense of uh, the total amount of uh, the, uh, the dollar profit that he would have made for the total amount of rupees that he would have gone short on a future basis now this portion of profit or loss which is going to be profit as it looks like is is, is in dollar terms so that needs to be uh, converted into rupees so this dollar profit will get sold in the spot market at this rate so we will divide it by the spot rate okay to get the rupee amount so this if you work it out it would be five four six zero dollars that's a profit and that would get sold in the spot market at this rate to give him a profit of three lakh seventy three thousand seven hundred seventeen okay so this profit plus the realization uh, in the spot market is what his total realization is going to be uh, minus the interest on margin that he would incur so he had deposited a margin of two lakh twenty four thousand and this was for three three months so at eight and a half percent for three months would give me the interest cost that would be incurred by the company which is four seven six zero so the total realization as far as the futures is concerned is going to be uh, of of uh, three seven three four seven six zero uh, that is going to be taken as minus figure plus three seven three seven one seven plus uh, the realization in the spot market four one zero six seven seven six two okay so that gives me four one four three uh, six seven one nine all right so this is what uh, the realization would be in the futures in case if he would have taken the futures route uh, in case if the person would not have hedged at all then clearly this is what his realization would be as we would see uh, because in that case the entire amount would get sold in the spot market at this particular rate so we realize that it's uh, it's 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 the futures which uh, gives me the maximum realization it's 4143 while in the case of uh, uh, forwards it was 411 so clearly the realization by way of the futures route is the maximum now let's move on and look at the next question 
Okay, so there we have it, another forex question, and this is again an exact replica of what you would have found in your practice manual. So I'll just quickly go through the question and maybe just uh, uh, flag a similar question which is already there in your manual. So you might just want to go through that. Uh, on 10th July, an importer entered into a forward contract with bank for US dollar 50,000 due on 10th September at an exchange rate of 66.8400. So here you have an importer who would have purchased 50,000 US dollar on a forward basis and he was supposed to take the delivery on 10th September and this was a contracted rate 66.84. The bank uh, uh, in its capacity covered its position in the interbank market at 66.6800 so the bank might have taken a counter position uh, just to hedge itself at 66.6800 how the bank would react if the customer requests on 20th September so mind it guys 10 September has passed after the settlement date he comes back on 20th September and says he wants to cancel the contract or let's say he wants to execute the contract or let's say he wants to extend the contract with due date to fall on 10th November all right now the host of rates have been given to us on 10th September, 20th September. The exchange margin has been given to us, the interest on outlay of fund 12% and we need to calculate, we are required to show the calculations. So what is exactly the amount that would be taken from this chap? And in case if we were to execute the contract or extend the contract, then what would be the rate that would be quoted to the customer? Okay, so this is going to have a long solution. So I'll just skip that, but before doing that, I'll just uh, flag a similar question that you have in your practice manual. So you might just want to go through this, uh, exactly the same question. It's just that the dates and the figures have been revised. Uh, otherwise, you have essentially the same dynamics playing out. This was due to be settled on 10th June and the customer comes on 20th June and requests to cancel or execute or extend the contract. Okay, so a long solution, but uh, in case if you've already gone through this, uh, you would already uh, be very, very familiar with what the working would be. In case if you haven't, then uh, for people who would be going through my tutorials, would see that I would have already discussed this type of question out there as part of my tutorial. Okay, so I'm going to skip this for a while and now proceed on to the next question. Okay, so this is how... Uh, one would solve this question. So let me just move on to the next one. So there we have. Details about portfolio of shares of an investor is as below. So the portfolio consists of three stocks ABC, the number of shares 3 lakh, 4 lakh, 2 lakh for ABC, price per share, the beta has been given to us. The investor thinks that the risk of the portfolio is very high, wants to reduce the portfolio beta to 0.91. He is considering two below mentioned alternative strategies. First, dispose of part of his existing portfolio to acquire risk free securities. So he's going to do away with some risky assets in his portfolio, bring in some risk free asset so as to lower the overall risk of the portfolio, lower the beta to a desired level of 0.91 or uh, alternatively take a proper position on nifty futures which would be like going short nifty futures to bring down the overall beta which are currently traded at 8125 and each nifty uh, points is worth 200 rupees so that means uh, that's going to be the multiplier or maybe that is going to be taken as the size of the nifty contract so what are we supposed to do we need to, to calculate portfolio beta to begin with, the value of risk free securities to be acquired to bring down the beta to 0 0.91, the number of shares of each company to be disposed of because we're going to sell part of the stock and replace it with risk free securities or alternatively when we go for the other strategy nifty futures going short, the number of nifty contracts to be bought or sold, we need to sell them. That's something that we should be very, very clear with and the value of portfolio beta for 2% rise in nifty. Now when I say we should be very, very clear that we would be selling it, that's on the premise that uh, our beta is going to be greater than 0.91, which is very likely because we have, which in fact is going to be because the beta of all the three stocks are way above 0.91. So the portfolio beta is way above 0.91. To bring it down, I would have to go short nifty futures. 
the value of portfolio beta for 2% rise in nifty now the last part is a little um, ambiguous because we don't know which portfolio are they talking about are they talking about the beta of the unhedged portfolio or the hedged portfolio so i think it's the last part which is a little ambiguous so i would assume that they are talking about the unhedged portfolio uh, we might just do that in case if it were to be the hedged portfolio let's say the one which consisted of uh, risky stocks plus the risk free securities then as well i think it should be fairly easy for you to calculate the beta it would be done in the same way so let's uh, look at this so uh, since we already have this part so i'm just going to take this portion of information and just continue with that to calculate the beta okay the portfolio beta we know the number of shares we know the price so we can calculate the value of each of these investments so that's going to be 3 lakh into 500 so that's 1500 lakh rupees 4 into 750 so that gives me 3000 lakh and 2 into 250 gives me 500 lakh so that's the value that you have in each of these securities okay so your total portfolio is worth 4,500, 5,000. So let me just write it over here. So your portfolio is worth 5,000. Now I need to calculate the weighted average uh, beta of the portfolio. So it's going to be 1.4 into 4, 1,500. 1 1.2 into 3,000. 1 and 1.6 into 500. Okay. So this gives me 2100, this gives me 3600, this gives me 800. It adds up to 2136 is 57, 865, so 6500. So my portfolio beta is going to be 6500 divided by the value of the portfolio, which is 1.3. Okay, so that's a weighted average beta of the portfolio, uh, 1.3. So we are done with the first part. The portfolio beta is 1.3. Now I need to bring it down to 0.91 by acquiring risk-free securities. That would mean that if my portfolio is worth 5,000 lakhs, I'm going to sell a certain portion of it. So let's call it, uh, we're going to sell a certain portion. So let's call it X, okay? And we're going to buy uh, X amount of risk-free securities. Now, my resulting beta, weighted average beta, is going to be 0 0.91. So it's going to be 5000 minus x. This carries a beta of 1.3. x carries a beta of 0. This divided by 5000 should give me 0 0.91. So I'm going to solve this and get the value of x. Now, if you work it out, you will realize that the value of x turns out to be 1500, which means which implies that 30% because 5000 is my total portfolio 30% of portfolio will be sold and uh, it will be replaced with risk free securities okay so that answers the second question the value of risk free securities which are to be acquired 1500 lakhs the number of shares of each company to be disposed of so let me just show you for a limited and i think you could you guys could do it for b and c now for A, the number of shares that we have is 3 lakh. Since you are selling off 30% uh, of the portfolio, so clearly 30% of A will as well going to be sold. So 30% of A is 30% uh, of 3 lakh is 90,000. So you're going to sell off 90,000 shares of A. Similarly for B, it's going to be 1 lakh 20,000, 30% of 4 lakh. And for C, it's going to be 60,000, 30% of 2 lakh. Okay, so that's fairly easy. Let's move on and look at the next one. The number of nifty contracts to be bought or sold. Let me just use this space to calculate this. Uh, what is the desired port? Uh, what is the desired beta that I want 0 0.91 minus what is the current beta which is 1.3 so we're going to take this okay uh, into what is the size of your portfolio 5000 so that's the amount of uh, uh, I would say 
beta in rupee terms which needs to be reduced. Now I know that the beta of Nifty is 1. Every unit of Nifty is worth 8125 and the number of contracts are, and, and the size of the contract is 200 units. So every contract will carry uh, this kind of rupee beta value. 8125 into 200 into 1, 1 being the beta. So when I divide this by this, it gives me, uh, and mind it, this is 5000 lakhs. So when I divide this by this, it would give me the total number of contracts that I need to uh, sell. And if you work it out, you would get that this turns out to be 120 contracts. Okay. Now move on and look at the next one. Uh, the value of portfolio beta for a 2% rise in Nifty. Now, it's going to be very similar to the way you have calculated beta out here. Guys, please remember this question is a little ambiguous. So I'm assuming that they are talking about the unhedged portfolio. What's going to be the beta of the unhedged portfolio? So in that case, the number of shares would remain the same. Okay. The price is going to be different because what is the beta of stock A? It's 1.4. So in case if Nifty would have risen by 2%, I would expect this stock to go up by 2.8%, 1.4 into 2%. So I'm going to take the price of the stock not as 500, but 500 plus 2.8% of 500. Okay. So which is going to be, I believe 14 rupees. Yeah. So I'm going to take the price of this share as 514. Similarly, I'm going to change the price of this stock. It should go up by 1.2% and this stock price should go up by 1.6%. So my prices will get revised. All right. So once I take the new set of prices, of course, the number of shares remain the same. We already know what their, their betas are. So betas would remain as they are. And then we'll recalculate the value and recalculate this, uh, this working because now my values are going to be different and then, uh, calculate the, 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 the new beta, which is going to be whatever summation that I get over here divided by, uh, uh, the, 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 the value of the portfolio, which is something that you would get over here by adding up these three. Okay. So uh, that is how one would calculate the beta of the unhedged portfolio. You might actually just go ahead and calculate the beta of the hedged portfolio. So I think in that case, this question can be taken as a quick follow up of this question. So since I am, uh, uh, I'm, I'm long my portfolio and I'm short uh, nifty futures. So you might just want to calculate, recalculate your portfolio beta. So let's look at the next question. The returns on market portfolio for a period of four years are as given. So I think the return on the stock and the return on the market portfolio has been given for the past four years for stock B. So this is stock B. Uh, you are required to determine the characteristic line, the systematic and the unsystematic risk. Now the characteristic line is essentially the regression line. So when you regress the stock return on market return, the regression equation that you get is known as the characteristic line. So in that case, we are talking about the stock return being equal to, let's say a plus B market return. Okay. So, uh, this would be the regression equation. So it's, uh, it's worth noting that I need to calculate the value of a, which is known as alpha and B, which is essentially the beta. Okay. For me to calculate beta or B, as I have put it, it's going to be the covariance of the stock return RI with the market return RM divided by the variance of market return. Okay. So that's how we would calculate. So we need to know the covariance and the variance of market return. Since we have the data points, we can easily calculate the covariance and as, as well as the variance. Uh, a is going to be the mean return of the stock. So A is going to be RI. Uh, so the mean of RI minus B times the mean of RM. 
since we already know the RIs and the RMs we can easily calculate the mean so I believe this part should not be difficult at all so what I'll do is just to pace up my working I'm going to transfer uh, this entire data onto the Excel calculate the covariance the variance and calculate the value of A and B consequently once we are done with that I think that's when we would look at the next part which is systematic and unsystematic risk of the stock okay so let's uh, move on to the Excel so guys there we have the data RI RM so that's what I have jotted down so let me first calculate the mean so it's going to be uh, the summation of all these divided by 4 so that gives me 8.5 and So the average uh, stock return is 8.5, the average market return is 6.5. Now covariance, if you remember, is x minus x bar into y minus y bar. We take the product and then we add it up. So let's calculate x minus x bar, which is ri, whatever values that we have, minus this particular value. So 10 minus 8.5, so let me just put it as ri minus uh, the mean of ri okay and out here I'm going to take rm minus the mean of rm all right and then I'm going to take the product of this so this is going to be 10 minus 8.5 which is 1.5 uh, this is going to be 12 minus 8.5 which is 3.5 uh, 9 minus 8.5 is 0 0.5 and 3 minus 8.5 is minus 5.5 similarly this is going to be 8 minus 6.5 which is 1.5 10 minus uh, 6.5 is 3.5 9 minus is I believe uh, 0. Point, okay uh, 9 minus 6.5 is 2.5 and minus 1 minus 6.5 is minus 7.5 so I worked this out and uh, and and let me take the product of these two so which is going to be this into this okay and I'm going to take the summation of this right so th there you have the summation all right so this is uh, this into this okay so if this is capital A this is capital B we have actually calculated A into B so this is AB and this is the summation of AB okay so what shall be the covariance? My covariance is the summation of the product, which is 57, divided by n. n would be the number of data points, which is the number of pairs that we are dealing with, which is 4. Uh, but I think uh, a more appropriate uh, uh, the divider is going to be n minus 1, which is 4 minus 1, 3, because here we are dealing with a sample data. And in that case, you calculate covariance by dividing it by n minus 1 and not n. Okay, so ideally it should be 19, 57 divided by 3. We also need to calculate, so this, this is the covariance, guys. I also need to calculate the variance of the market return. So variance of the market return, guys. How do we do that? Rm minus mean, we're going to take the square of this. Okay, so it's going to be this raised to the power 2 because you take x minus x bar whole square and uh, you're going to add it up so you're going to find out the x minus x bars uh, the square of x minus x bars for all the data points okay so and then add it up and similarly 
you are going to divide it by 3 because this is the sample data so your variance is 25.667 okay so what shall be the beta we just calculated so we did say that beta is equal to covariance divided by variance so it's going to be 19 divided by 25.667 which is 0 0.74026 okay alright so we've already got the beta so let's now calculate the alpha a I'd like I indicated your a is equal to so uh, in case if I were to go back to the your a is equal to ri bar minus brm bar so we know what is uh, the stock mean and the market mean so the stock mean is 8.5 so it's going to be 8.5 minus beta times okay 6.5 so that gives me 3.688312 so my characteristic line is going to be 3.688312 plus 0 0.74026 into the market return so let's let's take note of that alright so this is what we get we got this as the value of alpha this is the value of beta so this is my characteristic regression line now I need to calculate the systematic and the unsystematic risk uh, guys the total risk will be the total uh, variance of the stock okay uh, we need to calculate the total variance of the stock as well which I think we did not so uh, let's first calculate the total risk okay which is basically the variance of the stock return uh, systematic risk so when I calculate the variance of RI it's going to be equal to 3.688 so RI is equal to 3.688 so, uh, let me just explain this RI is equal to 3.688 plus 0 0.74 RM now this is of course a regression line uh, the actual returns will always have some uh, residual error let's call it E so when I try to calculate the variance of RI it's going to be equal to 0 0.74 square the variance of RM plus the variance of the residual term okay now this is unsystematic risk this is systematic risk so I can easily calculate systematic risk as 0 0.74 square into the variance of the market return we already know what is the market return okay the variance of market return is already known to us we we will still have to calculate the variance of the stock return so uh, once I calculate this this gives me the total risk this is the systematic risk I deduct this from this to calculate the unsystematic risk okay so that's how you would go about so maybe I can just skip this part you can easily calculate the variance of the stock return guys you know what is uh, uh, RI minus mean so you're going to take the square of these values add them up and divide it by 3 to get the variance of the stock return that's the total risk and what's the systematic risk I already know the variance of market return it's 25.67 so 0 0.74 square into 25.67 0.74 square into 25.67 is going to give you the systematic risk when you deduct this from the variance of the stock return you're going to get the unsystematic risk okay so let's now move on to the next one so let's look at this question mr. Abhishek is interested in investing rupees 2 lakh for which he is considering the following three alternatives uh, investing 2 lakhs in mutual fund X investing uh, 2 lakhs in mutual fund Y uh, or uh, investing uh, 1 lakh 20 in X and 80,000 in Y average annual return earned by MFX MFY 15% 14% the risk free rate is 10% the market rate of return is 12% so the returns have been given to us the covariance of return of MFX, MFY and market portfolio mix are as follows. So we've been given the uh, 
the, the matrix. So if you look at these numbers, uh, you should be able to understand that this is the variance of x, this is the variance of y, this is the variance of market. Okay. Now, this particular uh, cell 4.3, which is occupied by the value 4.3, is a is is a cross between MFY and MFX, so this would qualify as the covariance of XY. Okay, so that's how we are going to identify the variances and the various covariance pairs. So that will make life uh, very easy for us because uh, the question, the first part of the question, is where they are asking us to find out the variance of XY and market return. So that's pretty easy. The variance of uh, F MFX is 4.8, that of Y is 4.250, and that of market return is 3.100. Okay, uh, it's uh, interesting that they haven't really indicated any units for these, so one would like to believe that uh, these should be percent square, so that. Uh, that that's normally the unit that goes along with variances and covariances. So 4.8, 4.25, 3.1, that answers the first question. Portfolio return, beta, portfolio variance, and portfolio standard deviation. Now, uh, uh, they haven't, again, made it very, very clear whose return, beta, variances, and standard deviation is being asked for. So my guess is... Uh, it's for X, it's for Y, and it's for this mix because these were the three different portfolios that we were uh, looking at. So, uh, if I were to, okay, so let me just take it for the mix because I think it's pretty easy to calculate it for just X or for Y. So, let me just uh, look at uh, the, the, the combination of X and Y. So the third portfolio that we are talking about. So I'm, I'm guys uh, focusing on the third third portfolio. Uh, you can easily calculate because for me to calculate the return of the third portfolio, uh, I'll have to have inputs which would be needed here as well. So once I work this out, I think you will find it fairly comfortable working out X and Y. Okay. So my third portfolio consists of uh, uh, one lakh twenty thousand to X and eighty thousand to Y. So that makes it like a 0.6x plus a 0.4y kind of a portfolio. Okay, 60% into x, 40% into y. Now, uh, let's look at the uh, the, the the return. So, uh, uh, maybe we can first calculate the beta, okay, and then uh, uh, come back and find out the return. And again, we will try to find out the portfolio variance as well and portfolio standard deviation. So let's let's just work out all of these. Now the beta of the portfolio is going to be the beta of this portfolio. Okay, so that means we are trying to find out the beta of uh, of of this particular portfolio, which is 0.6x plus 0.4y. When you have a portfolio and we need to find out the uh, beta of a portfolio, that is as good as the weighted average beta of the individual stocks, which is 0 0.6 beta of X plus 0 0.4 beta of Y. This is something that you guys would be very, very comfortable with because we have worked out and found out the beta of a portfolio. You take the weights, you multiply with the individual betas, you add them up, and that's how you get the portfolio beta. So I need to find out the beta of X and beta of Y. The beta of X is covariance of the uh, of, of the stock return, the market return divided by the variance of market return. So let me have that. The combination of X and M, the combination of X and M gives me 3.3 cents. So that's the covariance divided by the variance of market, which is 3.10. So that would give me the beta of X. Beta of Y will be covariance of XM divided by variance, co covariance of YM divided by variance of the market. So covariance of YM, the cross between Y and M is 2.8. So that's 2.8 
divided by 3.10 so that's how you will get the beta of x and y once you get that you replace it over here to get the beta of the portfolio so let me just try and plug in the numbers okay so there we have uh, the beta of x the beta of y plug in these numbers over here and you're going to get the beta of the portfolio okay so that's fairly easy uh, to calculate the portfolio return, uh, one uh, basis of calculating the portfolio return is to take 15% and 14% uh, and take the weighted average of this 0 0.6 into 15 plus 0 0.4 into 14 and that would give me the average annual return. That's on an historical basis. If I want to get the equilibrium return based on the CAPM model, I know the beta of x, I know the beta of y, I can plug it in, get the return of x, get the return of y and then take the weighted average or alternatively I know the beta of the portfolio that can be plugged in into the CAPM model to calculate the portfolio return. Alright, so I'm, I'm just skipping some portion of working, I'm, 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 I'm just going to run through this and explain it to you guys how, how, do you, how you need to go about. Uh, how will I calculate the portfolio variance? So, uh, in case if I were to just show you the working, now the portfolio that we are talking about is uh, 0.6x plus 0.4y. Now, the variance of this is equal to 0.6 square, the variance of x, plus uh, 0.4 square, the variance of y. All right plus 2 into 0 0.6 into 0 0.4 covariance of x, y. Okay, now variance of x, variance of y, covariance of x, y, all these numbers are available over here. So you can easily plug them in and get the variance. Once you take the square root of this, you're going to get the standard deviation as well. Okay, so that that's, that's, that's good. Come over to the third part, expected return. That's something that we've already kind of found out. Expected return, portfolio return, expected return. Expected return is based on uh, the, uh, the, the, the equilibrium return. So that's something that we can work it out. And we did so. And so I, I think there's a bit of ambiguity between this and this. Uh, so maybe one is something that you will calculate based on 15%, 14%, and the other that you would calculate based on beta returns. Uh, systematic risk, unsystematic risk. So again, you have a repeat of this. In one of the earlier problems, we did see the discussion on systematic and unsystematic risk. Now, uh, I've calculated the variance of the portfolio. So that gives me the total risk of the portfolio. I also know the beta of the portfolio. And systematic risk is beta square variance of the market return. I know beta. I know the variance of the market return. I'll get the systematic risk. Once I deduct systematic risk from the total risk, which is measured by variance, I'm going to get the unsystematic risk. Okay. Sharp ratio. It's uh, sharp ratio is the return of the portfolio minus the risk-free return divided by the beta of the portfolio. I would know this. I would know this. I would know this. So that's pretty easy to calculate. Uh, I, I stand corrected. This is going to be the standard deviation of the portfolio. In case if I take the beta, that gives me the Trenner ratio. So RP minus RF by beta of P. Coming over to alpha of MFX, MFY, and portfolio mix. So let me just look at what will be the alpha of the portfolio. Uh, you would have calculated the portfolio return based on CAPM. You would have calculated the portfolio return based on the actual returns of X and Y get the difference between the portfolio return that is calculated based on actual return based on the CAPM model the cap between the two would give you alpha if the actual return is better than the equilibrium return CAPM then it's positive alpha or else it's negative alpha okay so that's how you would work out this particular problem I would say this was a good one so moving on KLM requires uh, 15 lakh for a new project, life of the project 3 years, salvage value nil, depreciation 5 lakh, given below are projected revenues and costs excluding depreciation and ignoring inflation and then they have given us the inflation tax rate is 35%, cost of capital 14% after tax and I would assume this is the nominal cost of capital so once we have the nominal cash flows then we're going to use this uh, cost of capital the inflation rate for revenues and costs year on year has been given to us 
the prison value factor at 14% for three years. Again, the discount factors at 14% given to us show the amount uh, to the nearest. We need to calculate the NPV. So again, a quick work. That's what I'm going to do. I'm not going to work it out completely. So th to begin with, you are going to calculate the nominal revenues. So let's say you have year one. So let's say I'm going to take year one, year two, year three. Let me take the revenues. The revenue for year one is 10 lakh. Now in year one, the revenue inflation is 9%. So you're going to take it as 10 lakh plus 9% of 10 lakh. Okay, because we are, these are real cash flows. We need to convert them into nominal cash flows. So I think that becomes 10 lakh 90,000 if my working is correct. Okay. Now for the second year revenue, which is 13 lakh, that will get inflated, okay, on account of inflation rate. Now it's since it's second year, you need to take the compounding effect of 9% inflation in year one, 8% inflation in year two. So uh, without working the number, this is how you're going to get it: 1.09 into 1.08. Okay, so that's going to give you the revenue of the second year third year's expected revenue is going to be 14 lakh into 1.09 into 1.08 into 1.06 so that's how you'll get the revenues and uh, cost similarly you're going to take 566.5 over here and of course you are going to inflate them into 1.1 this is going to be 1.1 into 1.09 and so on so forth okay so they're going to be three terms over here so I'll get the revenue, I'll get the cost. Okay. Now I'll also have depreciation. My depreciation is five lakhs. The useful life of the project is three years. The salvage value is nil. So five lakh divided by three, I think it gives you 1.67 lakhs. Okay. So that's something that we're going to take for each year. So we know the revenue cost depreciation. So I can easily calculate my PBT. Okay. I can multiply it with 1 minus T. My tax rate is 35%, so into 0.65, and that would give me my PAT. Okay, I'm going to add back depreciation to it to get the cash flows. So I'll have the cash flows with me. I'm going to discount these cash flows with the help of these discount factors, add them up, get the present value of cash inflow, deduct the immediate outflow, which is 15 lakhs and then see whether I get a positive NPV or not. Okay, so this was again a very, very simple question and clearly anyone who would have uh, done a similar problem earlier should not have taken more than uh, maybe five minutes, five to seven minutes to work out this problem. So moving on. So let's look at this question, which is based on factoring. Projected sales for the next year of Z Limited is rupees thousand crores. The company manages its accounts uh, receivables internally. Its present annual cost of sales ledger administration is rupees eleven crores. The company finances its investment on debtors through a mix of bank credit and own long-term funds in the range of sixty to forty. So the investment in receivables is being currently funded uh, by a mix of uh, bank credit and long-term funds in the ratio 60-40. Their cost has been given to us 10% and 12% respectively. The bad debts amount to 1.5% of total sales. The company has credit policy of 2 slash 10 net 30. That means uh, if the consumers are able to pay within 10 days, they can avail a 2% discount. Uh, on an average, 40% of receivables are collected within the discount period. So that implies that 40% of the customers do pay within 10 days and the rest are collected 70 days after the invoice date. So our receivables, uh, 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 the age of our receivables, so let's say the receivable days would be, are, are split 40%, uh, 60%. Uh, uh, with 40% uh, of receivables being 10 days and the remaining 60% being 70 days. So that will help me get a sense of what is the weighted average uh, life of receivables. Over the years, gross profit is maintained at 20% and the same is expected to be continued in future. Now the company is looking at the proposal from the factoring agency. Uh, so there are two proposals, one with uh, recourse, the other without recourse. Uh, their costs are different. So 
the advance that is extended are different across the two proposals 85 percent of receivables and 81 percent of receivables with which would be extended as advances for the recourse and non-recourse agreement respectively and the interest uh, that would be that means the discount that would be charged are again different 20 percent and 21 percent for the two types of the, uh, agreements uh, the proposal agrees uh, uh, provides for a guaranteed payment within 30 days from the date of invoice the factoring commission would be 4% without recourse and 2% with recourse now if the company goes for the factoring arrangement the staff would be underburdened and hence would be able to concentrate more on promotional activities so there would be an, a, an additional sales of 100 crores assume that all sales of the company are credit sales and the year is of 360 days so we need to calculate the cost of in-house management of receivables, the compute the cost of uh, the proposals with and without recourse. So we need to look at the cost of both the proposals and then do the cost benefit analysis and then finally take a call which would be the best option. So first we start off with uh, calculating the costs in-house. So let me uh, get hold of a pen. So. I'm going to look at uh, uh, the relevant cost in-house, okay? So we are extending cash discount, uh, which is uh, our total sales is 1000 crores, okay, 40% of it uh, a whale's cash discount and the discount that is uh, provided is 10 percent so that's 0 0.1 so 1000 into 0 0.4 is 400 400 uh, uh, the discount that is extended I, I stand corrected is 2 percent so 2 percent of 400 is 8 crores okay so that's 2 percent 0 0.02 uh, the next is uh, cost of funds please remember 60-40 ratio of 10% 12% cost of funds so the weighted average is 60% into 10% 40% 12% so 6% plus 4.8 10.8% so you will have a cost of fund of 0 0.108 and uh, uh, the total receivables uh, would be uh, we need to calculate the average receivable so uh, again, we need to take the weighted average. 40% of the receivables are collected uh, within the discount period. The remaining in 70, the 60% are collected in 70 days. So 60% of 70 days is 42 days. 40% into 10 days is 4 days. So 46 days is my receivable. So 46 by 360 into my total sales, which is 1000 crores. So that would give me a sense of uh, the cost of funds uh, which will be 13.8 crores okay bad debt on 1000 crores 1.5 percent so that's 15 crores okay and then you will have avoidable admin overheads so in case of uh, uh, you manage your receivables in-house there is an admin cost to the tune of 11 crores so admin overheads which can be avoided in case if I go for factoring is 11 crores okay so that would give me 8 13 is 21 36 47 47.8 all right now not to forget that there is an additional sales of 100 crores which can take place in case if we go for factoring. So uh, what's the kind of uh, profit that we forego because of this lost sales because, because we are trying to manage in-house. So 20% is being given as a gross profit margin. So 20% of 100 crores is 20 crores. So we would and, and you just need to be a little careful out here. So. Uh, the lost contribution is 20 crores okay so that makes it 67.8 crores now this would be the lost contribution in case if we go for factoring uh, without recourse because in that case uh, uh, you would earn entire 20% uh, profit 
the the loss on account of bad debt is something that would not haunt the company because it's uh, factoring without recourse so please remember this is when I'm taking without recourse okay now when it would be with recourse my relevant costs in-house is going to be 20 crores less 1.5 which makes it 18.5 that gives me 66.3 crores okay so this is without recourse guys do remember so in the first case this is when I'm my this is my relevant co uh, cost when I'm computing it uh, with respect to or comparing it to a factoring a proposal without recourse and this is with recourse okay so that that that's something that we need to remember so now let's look at the costs of uh, factoring so to begin with we are going to look at uh, factoring with recourse So my costs of factoring with recourse okay <clears throat> so you will have to pay factoring commission your factoring commission will be uh, uh, two percent as it has been indicated out here with recourse so it will be two percent of 1100 crores which is 22 crores okay then you will have discount charges because the factoring agency would be extending you advances and the advances that it would be extending would be 85 percent okay so you're going to have uh, 85% off so let me just work it out over here 85% off 1100 minus 22 okay so the factoring commission is always taken out so this gives me 916.3 so that's the amount of advances which would be extended and uh, so the factoring agency would charge a discount on this which is 20% so 0.20 into uh, 30 by 360 into 916.3 okay 30 by 360 into 916.3 which gives me 15.27 all right uh, next we have the cost of funds because uh, part of the uh, 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 advances would be received, uh, sorry, part of the receivables would be received a little later. Uh, so we just need to calculate the amount of advances, uh, the amount of receivables, uh, sorry, I stand corrected, the amount of receivables which would be paid within 30 days because uh, part of it is being paid up front and part of it is paid within 30 days. So the remaining, which is 1100 minus uh, 916 point three. Well, that's the amount of receivables which is uh, which is kind of uh, pending for 30 days. So, the interest cost that would be incurred is I'll take up uh, this particular cost as a relevant cost into 0 0.12 into 30 by 360. Okay, so that gives me 1.84. So that helps me calculate the cost, which is 39.11. Okay. So now let's move on and look at uh, the cost of factoring with recourse, without recourse. So my relevant co cost when I'm looking at without recourse. Factoring commission which is 4%. Four percent of eleven hundred crores is forty four crores. Discount charges. So let's calculate it over here. Uh, discount charges uh, eighty one percent of receivables. So it will be zero point eight one into eleven hundred minus forty four. Okay, 
so that gives me 855.36 and then I calculate the discount charges which is uh, 21 percent so 0.21 into 855.36 into 30 by 360 because this is paid uh, 30 days earlier so so to that extent the interest that is charged by the factoring agency is 14.97 we call it the discount charges and then we have uh, the remaining amount which will be paid 30 days later so there is some in-house interest cost that is incurred so it's going to be uh, 1100 minus uh, 855.36 and 12 percent of that for 30 days okay so that's how you calculate it it's going to be 2.45 so this gives me 61.42 okay 61.42 so that's going to be my cost without recourse now i need to do the cost benefit analysis so let's uh first do it in terms of uh, if I look at the factoring with recourse okay what is the relevant costs uh, that I incur so let's see it's 39.11 so the cost that I incur is 39.11 what I save that means my benefit in terms of saving is my in-house cost okay so what I save is 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 uh, 66.3 now guys remember within the 66.3 so I think I, I should have in fact uh, 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 taken note of this earlier but let me make amends the 66.3 is not the relevant savings when you have factoring with recourse because this also includes 15 crores of bad debt because if a bad debt is incurred irrespective of whether you appoint a factoring agency if it's with recourse this bad debt is going to come back to you okay so your effective saving is 66.3 minus 15 which is uh, 51.3 so maybe we could have not taken 15 crores while computing this okay so that makes it uh, uh, 51.3 so so we would say what you save is 51.3 okay so this is plus this is minus so net net what you gain is 12.19 how about without recourse uh, since we have enough space out here so I might as well do it over here without recourse Uh, what you incur your cost is uh, 61.42 and your savings is 67.8 this is deducted this is added and this gives us 6.38 so this clearly is a better proposal so maybe we could go for factoring with recourse so let's look at this question a company is considering hedging its uh, forex risk it has made a purchase on 1st July 2016 for which it has to make a payment of US dollar 60,000 on December 31st 2016 so between July and December end you have a six month period uh, the present exchange rate is uh, 65 rupees a dollar it can purchase forward one dollar at rupees 64 the company will have to make an upfront premium at the rate of two percent of the forward amount purchased the cost of funds to the company is 12 percent per annum 
In the following situation, compute the PNL the company will make if it hedges its forex risk with the exchange rate on 31st December 2016 as. So we need to look at what is the kind of profit or loss that the company makes if it hedges vis-a-vis -vis if it let, let it remain unhedged. Okay. So in case it hedges, it would be able to lock in a particular rate. In case if it doesn't, then it will have to uh, purchase the US dollar on, on, on the spot rate basis. So we need to look at what is the uh, uh, benefit or advantage or disadvantage that the firm would be able to derive on account of having taken a hedge. So let's look at in case if it goes for a hedge, I mean, it in, in uh, uh, given that it would go for a hedge, what would be its cash outflow? So if it books a forward, okay, then there are certain conditions to be met. Uh, it will have to purchase the the, the dollar at rupee sixty four uh, a dollar. So. Uh, the amount that it will have to pay uh, pays finally on 31st December when the forward gets settled will be rupees 64 into 60,000 okay uh, which is 38 lakh 40,000 38 lakh 40,000 now, not to forget that 2% of this amount is something that it would have to pay upfront today itself. So this is something that it pays on 31st. Upfront premium that it pays is 2% of this, which is uh, 76800, 2% of the above. Now, since we are looking at the cash outflow on the final date, since this amount is paid six months earlier, that means today itself, I need to take the future value of it. The future value of it is this amount plus the interest on it. So the interest amount is missing. So let me just take interest on the premium. Okay. And uh, interest rate is 12%. So I'm going to take 12% into 6 by 12 into 76,800 which is 4,608 so my total effective uh, outflow when I go for this hedge is 39,21,408 so what is the uh, advantage if the spot rate actually turns out to be 68 rupees a dollar I believe you would uh, uh, end up um, as a company you would end up having re uh, having a sigh of relief because uh, you were able to book your forward at a much lower rate even after I take into account the premium and the interest on premium so the first case and, and I'm just going to take up the first case because I think the others are very very similar so at rupees at rupees 68 a dollar on 31st December okay uh, your your outflow if dollar purchased on spot okay would have been uh, six thousand sixty thousand dollar into sixty eight okay so sixty thousand dollar into sixty eight that's what your outflow would have been which would have been forty lakh eighty thousand and your outflow because you took a hedge outflow due to the forward cover okay is 39,21,408 so you end up benefiting to the extent of 1,58,592 okay now in the second case you would actually have a loss because this amount is calculated as 60,000 into 62 which will be lower than this so clearly there is a disadvantage that the forward would bring and in retrospect uh, you would realize that maybe you should not have taken a forward but then that is something uh, that is hardly known when you would have decided to take a forward cover and guys do remember the utility of forward cover is 
it does not lie in making profit or loss but it lies in uh, bringing in certainty into your system okay okay another simple problem xn limited reported a profit of uh, 100.32 lakh so I'll, I'll just give you an approach as far as this problem is concerned and would not really indulge indulge myself into computation so it had a profit of 100.32 and then there were some extraordinary uh, losses in income and then and and these kind of profits the normal the normalized profit is going to continue in the future Apart from this, uh, there is this new business uh, which will bring in some extra cash flows, extra profit. Uh, the company has 50 lakh equity shares and uh, uh, 80,000 percent preference shares uh, with a P ratio of, being of, of 6 times. Uh, so we need to compute the value of the business, assume cost of capital to be 12% and determine the market uh, price per equity share. So when, when they ask you to compute the value of the business, uh, they've not really made it clear whether it's uh, uh, just equity that we need to value or it's a total business. Uh, I would like to assume that this would be the value of the firm. Uh, even if it were not to be, I mean, you could just compute both of them. So l l let's, let's just go ahead and do it. I think what you, whenever you have uh, some kind of ambiguity or confusion uh, in the problem, I think you should just state your assumptions very very clearly. So the profit of the company is 100.32. So let me just very quickly write it down. 100.32 is your profit pat. Okay. So my PBT is going to be 100.32 divided by 1 minus t, so which is 0 0.1 uh, minus 0 0.34, which is 0 0.66. So this I take it back to pre uh, pre tax level. And from that, then I make an adjustment for these extraordinary items. So there's a loss of 5 lakhs, so you add it back. Extraordinary loss, 5 lakh. That's what you add to this number. Okay. And since there's an extraordinary profit, that will get deducted. And when you compute this, you get what is known as the normal profit pre tax, not to forget. Okay. And to this, you're going to add the additional profit, which you'll get from this business, 70 minus 20 minus 16 minus 10. This, I believe, is the incremental fixed cost, so which is 20, 10, 30, 46. So I think you'll have 24 as additional profit. So this is something that you're going to add to this to get the, uh, the to, to, to get the normal profit at a pre-tax level. And uh, uh, then when you take uh, 0 0.66 times of this, okay, then what you get is, so let's, let's call the normal profit as n. So this is n plus 24. So n plus 24 into 0 0.66 gives you your uh, PAT. Okay, so if this is my PAT and this is what will recur year after year, this PAT, okay, this PAT, when uh, capitalized at 12% will give me the value of the business, will give me the value of the business, okay? Now, so I, I would like to believe that's how they, they want us to compute uh, because I'm interpreting business as the firm, all right? In case if it were equity, then you would deduct uh, the preference dividend from PAT and then uh, capitalize it at 12% to get the value of equity. Let's look at the next one. The market price per equity share, we know what is PAT. From that, we are going to deduct. So we know what is going to be the PAT. Uh, okay, I, I think we need to compute the market price today. If that were so, uh, this is a little tricky because uh, they haven't really exactly mentioned whether this is, uh, okay. Uh, whether this is a fair fair value of uh, equity share that we need to compute or the current market price now if it's the current market price i need to get the current eps uh, the current eps is uh, okay uh, if i were to take this p ratio as and i think that that's going to be a valid uh, interpretation that if the market is looking at uh, the forward pe which is uh, 
the, the, the price earning multiple being six times the projected EPS okay so the my projected EPS is going to be this particular part okay minus preferred dividend all right which I can calculate 9% of 80,000 into 100 this when deducted and when divided by 50 lakh shares would give me the projected EPS and that when multiplied with 6 would give me the market price. So in that case state it very very clearly that the PE ratio that you have taken is being interpreted as the forward PE ratio that means uh, price is being expressed as the multiple of the projected earnings. All right, I think that should be well in line with the kind of working that we are uh, uh, showing over here. So I think this this problem is uh, fairly easy, and anyone who would have attempted this uh, should get it uh, done in uh, quick time. The next one again was quite an easy problem, so uh, I I might just want to you know save myself from doing all the working. But if you realize uh, this problem is uh, is a classic. Uh, 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 cost uh, 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 is, is a classic uh, uh, cost benefit analysis kind of a problem so you have a certain stretch where which is frequented by very heavy traffic and because of which there is uh, 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 some cost that is incurred on account of uh, the policemen that are manning the stretch on account of uh, the delay that is caused and so the, so so there are quite a few costs which has been uh, indicated out here so it's fairly easy for us to calculate what will be the cost and uh, and and then uh, uh, a solution is being provided in terms of uh, uh, setting up a flyover which will have its own cost in terms of investment and maintenance costs and so on but then there will be savings on account of uh, a few costs so you just need to do some kind of a cost benefit analysis and then you basically suggest uh, whether it's really worth going for the flyover okay so a uh, classic costing kind of a problem uh, I'm a little surprised that it finds its way in the SFM paper but uh, nevertheless I'll make sure that I, I cover the solution of this problem in my um, in my in my video sessions um, so uh, I, I'll, I'll just skip it for a while but uh, this problem again was pretty easy so in, in, in case even if it were to come across as new problem anyone who would have invested his mind into this uh, in the exam hall should 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 be able to get it through uh, next set of questions again these are um, uh, the theory questions so I would suggest you might just want to go through each of them and read a bit on all of these points okay so I'm going to stop here uh, thank you I hope uh, this analysis benefits you